Um, the first thing you want to do is um, standardize your protocol. So that basically means you want to make sure that um, all your reagents are the same, uh, same lots, you're buying them from the same vendor, everything is, you know, you're not using like really old stuff. Your protocol is super detailed. So uh, in terms of like temperature of incubation, the lengths, what speed you're centrifuging at, what volumes you're staining in, you know, titrations of antibody, all that stuff needs to be like super consistent. Um, you need to stain, stain the same number of cells. That's a, that's a big one. Most people, I don't know about most people, but a lot of people don't count cells before they stain. And usually you can get away with that. You guys have probably have done that plenty of times and usually it, you can get away with it. Um, when you're trying to compare a lot of samples like algorithmically, it's really important that your data is just as tight as possible. So I would recommend counting out a certain number of cells that you're gonna stain, aliquoting those, and then um, staining in the same volume for all your samples. I know that can be a little bit time consuming, but it's, it's pretty important to do. Um, so that's kind of the sample prep side. The other side of it is the instrument side. Um, you wanna make sure that your, the instrument is performing the same on day one as it is day two. And so um, we have a standardization protocol in this gift that a couple of you maybe have, um, I, I've done a little like over, um, lunch or whatever, a little tutorial on how to use the standardization protocol. And I'm happy to um, share that with you, like our, our document. I know Julia does it. Um, people in Kirk's lab have been doing it and Katrina's lab. Um, and what, what this will do is it'll basically make sure that every day you're using the cytometer, you're reading the same level of fluorescence intensity. Um, and what you'll have to do sometimes is change your voltages to make sure the cytometer is seeing colors exactly the same on day one as it is on day two. Um, and so um, I can, oh yeah, we can talk about that another time. Um, and then um, the other one that's important to standardize is your file labeling. Um, so these algorithms really don't like it if you have different like parameters. So you wanna make sure in all your experiments you have the same number of parameters and you have the same labels on the parameters. So for example, um, like if you had one day you had uh, Fitzy uh, and the other day you had GFP as your parameter, that wouldn't work. Um, it has to have the same exact parameter. So keep it GFP every time or keep it Fitzy every time, but don't uh, go back and forth. Um, and the other thing is um, tube naming convention. You wanna be um, really consistent with how you name your tubes so that they're comparable between experiments. And this is a really big one. You wanna make sure the axis labels are all the same. So, you know, when you look at the experiment layout in the LSR and you can tell it, oh, APC is CD4, right? You wanna make sure that CD4 is always the same, right? So it can't be um, CD4 with no space and then the next day you put CD space four. Um, it has to be super consistent. Best way to do that is just duplicate your old experiments without data. Um, to make sure all your parameters are the same and all your labels are the same. Okay, so that's just kind of before you start what you have to do to collect good data for an algorithm. Um, next, um, what does raw flow data look like? So basically raw flow data, um, you know, it's, you see it as an FCS file that you like drag into your program of choice, be it Lojo or FCS Express or whatever. Um, but really behind that FCS file, it's just um, a data matrix like this. Um, you could even um, open it in Excel if you have the right conversion. Um, basically along the, each column, the first row is just the labels, the names. And then every different, um, every different row is a different cell going down. So if you have, let's say you collected 20,000 cells in an experiment, you'd have 20,000 rows in your FCS file. <clears throat> and then as far as what are these numbers? So these are actually the raw intensity values for each of these channels. So like, um, let me take the example of um, CD3, right? So you have like this cell right here, first cell, first row. 
at a value of 1,100, right? So that's a reasonably, that's about 10 to the third. Um, this one had a 183, right? So you can see these have different values. Probably the ones that are like a thousand, like 10 to the third, those are the T cells in this experiment. And the ones that are, you know, zero or low hundreds, those would be like an example of something that's like 10 to the two. Um, those would be um, not T cells. So this is what all your data really looks like uh, inside that FCS file. This is, this is kind of important just to, to realize that it's of data structure that can easily be put into like algorithms and R scripts, for example. Um, so what can we do with data that looks like this? So let's look at um, um, what TSNE does. Are, are you, have you guys all heard of TSNE? Are you all familiar with TSNE? Um, I think I heard about it for the first time today in the advanced immuno class. So oh, not awesome. super, yeah. Okay. Good timing. Um, but you've seen plots that look like this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, basically what's, what's going on here is um, this is a two-dimensional plot. Um, but what the algorithm does is it, it clusters all your cells um, in, in high-dimensional space. So basically what it's doing is it's finding the cells that are most similar to each other when considering all the parameters in your experiment. So let's say you had 10 colors. It's looking at all those 10 colors simultaneously and figuring out what cells have the least distance from each other when they look at when you're considering all 10 colors. Um, and then it would put the cells that are most similar to each other um, closer to each other on this two-dimensional map. It's basically, this is like a dimensionality reduction. It's a lot like um, principal component analysis. It's a way to reduce a very complex data set into a more um, digestible um, visual form. Um, so, and then what you can do after that is you can um, apply like heat maps. So this is an example of looking at CD, a heat map for CD4 expression. Um, and so you can see the red, this big ball right here, would be the CD4 cells. And these things that are blue have low CD4 expression. This kind of has some somewhat intermediate. Um, and then if you were to look at CD8, a heat map for CD8, you can see this ball up here has high CD8. And then the CD4 cells are were low, right, for CD8, et cetera. And you can look at CD20, which is a B cell marker for human. Um, you can see there are B cells over here. Um, and this gets really useful when you have a lot of things, a lot of colors, basically. And so I want to talk just a little bit about the strengths uh, and weaknesses of TSNE. Um, people love TSNE. It's like probably the most, like if you go to any high dimensional flow analysis kind of talk or anything, you're going to see these plots um, because it's so it's such a good way to visualize things. It shows you every cell and where they fall on that map. Um, and so it's become like super popular. Um, it helps identify subsets that are perhaps not obvious to you. You might, um, you know, you might have gated in such a way that you lose a population that everything will show up on the TSD map somewhere. Um, and it can work with um, many parameters. So people can do this for single cell RNA-seq data as well, which you've probably seen. Um, and there's another algorithm now called UMAP that's also, it looks very similar to TSNE. And that one's a little more popular for single cell RNA-seq data. Um, one of the, the downfalls to TSNE is um, a lot of the downstream ways to analyze that are not standardized, I would say. Um, so what would you do with this plot? Um, well, you could come in and use a polygon tool in Flojo and just draw a, a polygon around this population, right? Or around that population. Um, but then you're introducing some user bias, which is one of the things algorithms try to eliminate, right? Is like your sort of inherent bias about data. So, um, 
it's not completely like well um, standardized how everybody, what everybody does downstream with getting this, this pretty uh, T-SNE plot. Um, and one of the things you'll notice about this is it doesn't, T-SNE doesn't actually give you any percentages. It doesn't actually really um, group the data or gate the data in any way, right? You don't see any, you, you see like, you can just visually see that things are clustering, but it's not telling you, oh, 10% are in this population right here and 20% are here. It doesn't tell you any of that. It's purely a visualization tool. Um, so it can only do so much, um, but it's still really useful, but we need other tools besides just TSNE to actually make sense of the data, gate it, and make comparisons between samples. Um, one of the other um, things about TSNE that's a little problematic is it, it can be really slow. Um, so other algorithms have gotten a lot faster than TSNE, but uh, I'd say TSNE is still the most widely um, used. And so we'll run it today and you'll see it might take like five minutes to run uh, on a sample. If you had a lot of events, it you know, could take like hours to run, which is most people don't have that kind of time. Um, so um, there's another tool that I'm gonna talk about today called Flowsum. And it stands for Flow Self-Organizing Maps. It's basically um, uh, another tool that groups data, um, but it actually, um, it clusters the data. So it groups it into, you could think of it as it gates it in high dimensional space. So you'll get your like normal percentages out that you would want to get out from, um, from, a, like a, from a, any analysis. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. Um, and so I just wanna introduce the data set we're gonna use for this demo. Um, there is one staining panel from four different types of lymphoid cells. So this was data I acquired a couple of years ago. It's basically a 10 color panel um, where I'm looking at um, what are called intraepithelial lymphocytes. This is like intestinal lymphocytes laminopropria lymphocytes. It's another kind of anatomical location in the intestines. Um, mesenteric lymph node and Peyer's patch. Peyer's patch is another secondary lymphoid structure um, on the intestine. So it's basically all lymphocytes, just slightly different anatomical locations uh, in the intestinal compartment. And so since I think you guys are all, it's good that you guys are all kind of have a little bit of a T-cell background. Um, you just, a lot of these markers should make sense to you, what we're gonna to see today. But basically I have a viability die on E4506. Uh, CD45, that's just gonna be used to gate just hematopoietic cells. B220 is my B cell marker. I have CD3, CD4, CD8, CD8 alpha and beta. So in the gut, there are these T cells called um, intraepithelial lymphocytes that are, that. Um, I don't know if I should get into this much detail, but basically CD8 is a heterodimer on conventional T cells. There's an alpha subunit and a beta subunit. Um, in the intestine, there's a lot of cells that only express the alpha unit, a homodimer of the alpha unit. And so they don't have the CD8 beta chain. And so we'll see that in some of the cells that we look at. And then I have um, TCR beta, TCR gamma delta. Um, so the two main, um, um, class of, of T cell receptor. And then CD25 is just another, um, some regulatory T cells and some other T cell types. So if we were to look at, um, you know, just conventional plots of this data, basically I just went through and I conventionally gated this how I would. You don't have to worry about what I'm doing here exactly, but you can kind of see basically I'm gating, looking within that gate, looking within that gate, right? So there's a lot of like hierarchy. And um, when you have this many markers, so there's 10 markers, um, eight of which are really useful. Um, one's a viability marker and the other is just going to help us gate hematopoietic cells, CD45. And then eight, like really what I would consider like lineage, T, uh, hematopoietic lineage markers. Um, so that's what the data looks like. And I think you can probably appreciate that like there are a lot of little like subsets of cells in here that we may n miss. Um, with conventional gating. Um, and so that's where the, what we're gonna do today comes in. So let me go ahead and 
minimize this, and I'm going to go straight into Flojo. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open my, I'm going to pull my files in. So, um, I'm going to pull these four files in. Okay. So it gave it a slightly different name, but this is the IEL intraepithelial lymphocyte, lamina propria lymphocyte, Pyrus patch, and mesenchymal lymphocyte. And let me just start by opening up the IEL one. This is just basically what I'm going to do right now is kind of conventional pre-gating. So with these algorithms, you want to get rid of um, any debris and any dead cells, any of that stuff before you get started with those tools. So what I'm going to do, I'll kind of just show you how I do it. Basically, I'm going to take a polygon. I kind of know where my lymphocytes fall. I can toggle through my samples, just make sure that they all look pretty good. And this one tends, tends to have a lot of red blood cells and debris in it. I'm going to draw a gate just roughly like this. I'll draw it really broad for now. I'll just call it lymphocytes. I'm going to drag it up to all samples. And then I'm just going to toggle through and make sure that I'm kind of catching everything I want to catch. And I think that actually looks pretty good. I'm just eliminating probably dead cells and debris and red blood cells. Um, so next I'm going to click on this gate. I'm going to do a classic what I do for a doublet, which is forward scatter height versus width. I'm going to draw a gate like this. It's in the cells, it knows what I'm trying to do. Apply that to everything. And I'm just going to toggle through and make sure I think it looks how I want it to look. And yeah, I usually try to eliminate this high width stuff out here. Um, after that, let's open this up and look at uh, my viability guy, which was 506. And I'll look at it versus CD45. And what I'm going to try and do here is we're seeing, okay. I'm going to try and gate um, my CD45 positive viability dye negative cells. So if I kind of toggle through, I can get a little sense, but the dead cells are these ones up here. It wasn't the best separation, but I'm going to probably draw a gate, something like this. I'll just call this live. You can probably notice too, there's some stuff over here. Um, this, if you ever see this in your data, this is probably antibody precipitate. So sometimes um, you see on protocols to quick spin your antibody tube. It's a good idea because the precipitate will go to the bottom of the tube. So you're only pulling out the antibody in, in solution. Because um, if uh, like a little clump of antibody goes through, it's gonna show up as something like uber bright um, on the axis basically. Um, so I'm going to gate that out and get rid of that. Let me drag this up to everything and just make sure it looks pretty good. I think that's okay. I'm probably getting a few dead cells here. I'll move this down just a little bit. Yeah. I just want to make sure that gate works for all the samples. It seems reasonable. And then when I was looking at this earlier, I wanted to actually pull up one more parameter. Um, which is the PE parameter, because I noticed same deal. See how the, there's some stuff way out there? I actually wanted to get, oops, I wanted to get rid of that. So anyway, I'm just kind of pulling up two parameters. I want to just basically grab, I know that's garbage out there. I want to just grab this. I'll call this cells um, to get rid of this stuff out here. It's just a very small percentage of stuff, but it could um, create like a false population when the algorithm looks at it. Yeah, so I'm gonna get rid of that. Okay, so, so far I feel like I have pretty good cleaned up data. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and save this. I'll just call it clean data. Okay. And now this is kind of normally what you guys would do, right? You'd look at, okay, well, let's look at CD3 versus uh, B220. 
and look at our T cells and our B cells, and then you've got some double positive ones. Um, that's probably normally what you guys would be doing. Um, so what I want to do now is, now that I've cleaned this data up, I want to export it and make a new file out of it. Um, and this is, this is kind of important because um, the algorithms I find, you don't want a bunch of extra gates and extra data. So I'm going to make this as simple as possible. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to right click on the cells. And if I want to select all of them, I can hit this button that says select equivalent nodes. It's going to highlight all of those. So if you, this, that comes in handy if you have, let's say, 20 samples, right? And you want to export all just the cells gate. You can hit select equivalent nodes, right click again, export concatenate. So this, this feature does either exports the data or concatenates the data. Um, concatenate we'll come back to, um, but what concatenate means is basically merge all that, those files into a single FCS file. Uh, we don't wanna do that just yet, but we will use that later. For now, I'm just gonna export the clean data. So let me go back to that folder. Um, and I'll call this export. Um, and then it's asking me, what do I want to export? So I'm going to include all the data at this time. Uh, you're going to notice that each file has a different number of cells in it, like 92,000, 112,000, et cetera. Some of these are really big. Um, that will come into play later. Um, for now, I'm going to include everything and I'm going to select over here, all compensated parameters. So what this is gonna do is um, it's gonna basically strip all, the, comp all the, the compensation matrix away from the file. So what I mean by that is um, you guys know that normally when you have a FCS file, it, you have like all the raw data and then you have a compensation matrix or like a table that has the, the compensation values that Flojo reads in and then Flojo like fixes, it compensates your data. And so you can view your data as uncompensated in Flojo or compensated. Um, just in using these algorithms, I found that um, it can get, it, sometimes they can mess up the compensation. So when I check this all uncompensated parameters, what it's doing is basically it's rewriting the data to where the compensation values are like hardwired into the file. And so what that means is your compensation is, there is no more compensation at, after this point. Like your data points are fixed where they are and you can't adjust the, the table. Um, but that's, it's actually a kind of an important thing because uh, in using these things, I found that um, they are a little buggy at times. So I've kind of worked out a workflow that I know works, uh, at least for me. So I'm gonna export all my compensated parameters, hit export and it's writing them. It wrote four files. Um, and I'm gonna open those in a new workspace. So I'll just hit close, I'll cancel here. I'm gonna close my clean data, I'll save it. Now I've got a new workspace um, with those clean files in them. So if I open this, what you'll notice is that, see all that garbage and debris is all gone. If I look at um, if I look at CD45 versus the viability die, what you're going to see is that it's all in that positive gate that I had drawn. So no more non-hematopoietic cells and no more dead cells. Okay. So far, so good. Everybody following along? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, <clears throat> okay. So now, at this point, what I want to do is um, just show you what TSNI looks like when you run it in Flojo. So you always have to save before you run TSNI. So I'm going to save this workspace, I'll save it in the export folder. I'll just call it export, new workspace. Um, and I'm going to run TSNI. So I'm going to go to the workspace ribbon, or tab, I think, and click on the TSNI. And it's gonna ask you, what do you want to cluster your data on? So this is really important. You don't wanna cluster on 
but not informative parameters because it can mess things up. Um, you only want to cluster, or I shouldn't say cluster. You only want to run tSNE on parameters that are informative. So by that, I mean things that can separate the data. So CD3, CD25, B220, CD8 alpha, all of my lineage markers. But importantly, I'm not going to run it on dead because I already pre-gated that out, right? I'm not going to run it on CD45 as well because I already pre-gated that in. Um, and I don't want to run on time. Um, that, would make, that wouldn't make sense. Um, and usually people don't actually cluster or don't run TSNE on scatter as well. Um, I'm not 100% sure why, but um, I think it's because um, it's usually on a linear scale and the separation is not as great as, it, as the fluorescent separations. So usually when I see people doing this, they're only doing it on like fluorescent, kind of more of the linkage markers um, or just markers that go up and down dramatically. Okay, so I'm gonna leave all the um, defaults on this. David, it's getting a little bit hard to hear you. I'm not sure if the mic is oh. being heard. Is it, can you hear me now or no? Um, yeah, a little bit better. A little better? Yeah. Okay. And I'm kind of wondering what's going to happen when I run TSNE because it is really um, computationally intensive. Um, so we'll see if it kind of slows down when I run this. I am I sounding okay now or is it worse? No, it's better. It's better. Okay. Maybe I wasn't talking into the thing. Okay. So I'm going to leave the defaults and I'm going to hit run. And it's going to start initializing. Um, and it's going to run the algorithm and it's going to take it this file is probably going to take about five minutes is the zoom still working okay can you still hear me yeah okay cool i was a little bit worried i know like when you do run this your computer will probably like heat up a little bit um like i know mine always starts to heat up when i run tsne and everything else really slows down like my mouse is getting really choppy and stuff um Okay, so I'm gonna let that run. It's probably gonna take five minutes. And while, while that's running, um, we can, should be able to still do other things. Um, just you don't wanna do so much while that's running. Um, for those of you that use Flojo, I don't know if, do you use this color access feature? Has anybody used this before? No. Okay, so this is really cool. This is like, um, so let's say you're looking at a 2D plot. Um, let's look at CD3 versus, um, uh, I don't know, B220. And let's say we wanna know in this plot, like where are the CD4 cells? It's basically a way to get a third piece of information on a 2D plot. So if I click color axis, so right now it's color, it's giving me a heat map for CD3. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Because we're looking at CD3 on the Y axis. So that's why it's red at the top and, and blue at the bottom. But if I wanted to know, well, where are the CD4 cells? Okay, it's gonna be a little hidden because there's so much data here. But they would be back here. Let me see if I, the CD8 will probably look better. Yeah, so if I wanna know where are CD8 cells in this plot. You can see they're basically all this stuff up here, whereas this stuff here is low for CD8. All right, so it's almost um, analogous to like a three-dimensional plot. Um, if any of you have tried to look at it, I find that three-dimensional flow plots are really hard to look at. Um, and so this is actually a much better uh, and easier way to visualize like a third piece of information when you're um, looking at flow data. Uh, and this, this is gonna come, we're gonna come back to this uh, color axis quite a bit. So I just wanna introduce that to you. Um, yeah, I don't wanna do too terribly much while TC is running because I don't wanna crash it. Does anybody have any um, questions at this point? Um, I had a question, David. Um, just as about uh, just as you were about to run the TCNE, um, there were like a values at the bottom of the of the window. 
Yeah. Um, are those preset according to the algorithm or are they defined by the cell type that you're running? So they're preset according to like a standard TCE run. So it has nothing to do okay. with the cells you're running. Okay. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, the software defaults, which usually do a pretty good job. Um, if you're finding though that your data is not separating nicely into populations, um, you may want to run more iterations. So if you see on the screen here, it's running a thousand iterations of the model. Basically what it's doing is it's, it's like, um, it's more, um, it's maximizing the, the distances between all the like dots. Uh, and so the more iterations you run, the bigger the distance will get between the dots. So you'll get like better resolution, the more iterations of the model that you run. Um, but it's going to take longer. That's the trade off. Um, so I typically just leave it on a thousand. Um, and that seems to work okay. It just kind of depends on your data, actually, to be honest. And then there's other, there's all sorts of implementations of TSNE. Um, I haven't played around too much with all the implementations. I've just been using the base, the standard one. Um, but you can play with the other ones. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh huh, you're welcome. And. It's, it's up to, you know, 460 iterations, but it goes fa uh, fast at the end. This, I think this particular one, um, like once it sort of figures it gets to a maximum point in the separation, it basically ends the algorithm. So it may not take as long at the end of it. Um, okay. So let's just hang tight for just a minute, unless you guys have any other questions. Have any of you guys looked at IELs or LPLs before? Interesting population. So let's look at, uh, let's look at TCR gamma delta versus TCR alpha beta. So you have a ton of gamma delta T cells in the IEL, that's what's here. Uh, you can see that, uh, they express high levels of CD3 as do the alpha betas. Okay, it finished. The CD4s are pretty much the alpha, these are all pretty much CD8 cells that are the gamma delta T cells in the IEL. Okay. All right, so it's done and it gave us a plot that looks like this. And so what you're gonna see is that it's giving you two new um, parameters. So all our typical parameters are there, and then it has one that's called TSNE1 and TSNE2. And if you look at those against each other, you're gonna get like a map like this. Right now, it's not coloring the clusters in any way, but let's say, let's come back to that color axis where I can put this heat map. So if I click um, CD3, for example, you're gonna see where all the CD3 cells are. Um, which is pretty much all the orange and red stuff. And then you can see, so there's like stuff over here. It's not CD3. I'm guessing those are B cells. So let's look at B220. Yeah, so do you see how these are positive for B220? So those would be your B cells. Um, we can look at, let's look at CD4. So you can see we get a really tight cluster of CD4 cells here. Um, you know, we can look at any of these parameters. Let's look at CD8 beta. So CD8 beta are your, your conventional CD8 cells. You can see a really tight cluster here. Let's look at CD8 alpha. So these are, oops, I clicked on the wrong thing. I wanted to click on color axis. CD8 alpha. Where are you? Oh, there. So you can see a lot, there are a lot of these CD8 alpha cells in here that don't have CD8 beta. Um, let me save this. And now um, that's, you know, a lot of the time that's how you would 
what you would do just initially when you got this is you would just click on all your different colors, see where those different types of cells fall. Um, there's another way to look at this that I think is pretty useful if you wanted to start, you know, gating these things. Um, and it's a little trick um, where you open the layout editor and I'm going to create um, just a circle. I'll just call this um, probe. This is where we're going to just probe around and see what's what. And um, in my layout editor, so let's just pull it, put it right there for now. For this probe, let me just drag this. Actually, hold on one sec. Let me look at a histogram of CD3. And I'll drag this over. And basically, what I'm going to do is create a bunch of plots here. So I'm just going to copy and paste them and look at different parameters on each plot. <clears throat> you guys kind of follow what I'm trying to do here? I'm basically, I'm trying to see what markers are present wherever I have my little probe on the TC plot. So let me, let me create just a couple more. I could do all the parameters. For the sake of brevity, I'm just going to do those ones. Let me, um, could you show how you've made the probe again? Sorry, I missed Oh, sure. Yeah. Just so like in Flojo, just like you're making any old gate in on a Flojo plot, I could have mm -hmm. done a polygon. I just happened to do a circle. Okay. And then I just just clicked on the plot. Okay. Yeah, and it created it. Okay. Yeah. And then I, so just basically like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. It would be like equivalent in FCS here. Express. Yeah, just um, making a gate. Okay. Are you guys um, I should ask, are you guys um, doing this in real time or are you just observing? Uh, observing. Okay. Observing. Okay, cool. All right, so anyway, with my little probe now, I can say, okay, well, what are these cells? And so this, let's just go on this population here. I can see they're low for CD3, low for CD25, high for B220, low for CD8, and low for CD4. So I would say, okay, well, that's a B cell, right? Um, for any immunologist, and I can move this around and say, okay, these are all B cells. They're all the same profile. Now let me go right here, what's this thing? Okay, this thing is high for CD3, low for CD25, kind of intermediate for B220, low for C8, and low for CD4. So that's interesting. That is probably some type of a T cell, maybe a non-canonical, non-CD4, non-CD8 T cell. Um, that's the kind of thing you might miss in your conventional gating, right? Let's move down here. This thing down here, high for CD3, high for CD4, low for everything else, conventional CD4 T cell probably. Move over here, high for CD8 uh, alpha, low for CD4, low for B220, high for CD3, probably conventional CD8 cell, right? And so you can just move this around and figure out what's what. And then you could simply like, let's say, okay, I figured out that this whole thing right here is a B cell. I could go in and just kind of like you're doing normally, I could just make a gate around it, call it B cells. And I can say, okay, well, there are 12% um, B cells in my sample. Uh, and you could just keep doing that for all your populations. So that's, that's one way to, um, that's one way to analyze these TC plots or what you can do with them. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so what I want you to notice, though, is that this TC plot, I can't see it on my other samples. So when I ran T, when you run TC, it only runs it on like the sample that you're on, and you can't apply it to other samples. So that's really um, um, an important thing to know, and I'll sh show you how you can basically compare all your samples in this TC plot. But for now, we've just run it on one sample. So it's, it's, it's interesting to look at for that one sample, but it's hard then to compare to the other samples. 
Um, and um, let's see. Yeah. So that's where um, I'm going to come in with um, the second tool I want to talk about, and that's um, Flowsome. So Flowsome, um, I told you, is similar to TSNE in that it it's dimensionality reduction, but it also clusters. Um, so let's let's close that for an X. Let's let's just go to like CD four versus CD eight plot. CD eight data. That's fine. Um, heat mapping on B two twenty. Okay. So let's just look at this like we usually look at it. So now let's say we want the algorithm to automatically determine populations for us, cluster them, tell us percentages without having to do what we were just doing manually. Um, so I'm going to run Flowsome, which I have to click on the plugins. I've just, I'm going to click on the sample plugins, click Flowsome. I'm going to select the same exact parameters that I did for the, the uh, TSNE. So I want to exclude the viability exclude CD45, don't include those new parameters it made. And now for Flowsome, it, we have to sort of instruct it a little bit on the number of clusters. So this is a little bit subjective. You're basically telling Flowsome how many clusters do you want it to find. Um, for this data, I'm just going to ballpark 15. Um, I'm going to say, well, roughly looking at that TSNE plot, there are about 15 different populations of cells. It's better to overestimate than underestimate. You don't want it to miss um, two populations, um, but it may sub, if you overestimate, it may subdivide populations that aren't different into two different clusters, but that's not usually the end of the world. Um, I'm gonna leave all the other stuff as the defaults. We can, if you guys are interested, we can talk about what all those other things are, um, but I'm just gonna leave it and run it. And one of the nice things about Flowsum is it's a really, really fast algorithm. So usually it takes 10 to 15 seconds for this many events to run, um, as opposed to TSNE, which probably took um, about five minutes to run. This one should just, yep, it's done. So it took maybe 15 seconds. Um, and so it creates a bunch of gates. You can see this flowsome pop zero through pop 14. And you can say, okay, well, what does that mean? And I found that the easiest way to look at this um, is to go back to our TC map. Um, and color it based on the flow sum population. Um, so this is those two things. We're gonna hit color axis. So right now it's looking at B220. I'm gonna click here and click on flow sum. And what you're going to see is it's, it's going to give it, it's going to color each of these clusters um, differently. So like pop zero is one color, pop one is a different color. And so I think you guys will notice that the two algorithms are very similar in how they group the data, right? You guys see that? As meaning the colors are very defined on the, things you would expect to have different colors, right? Like this thing here looks like a separate population and it's orange. This thing here looks like a separate population and it's this greenish color. So the two things have found very similar results and you should always sort of validate like with a couple of methods that you're, you know, you don't want to just plug something into an algorithm and trust that the data that it spits out, you kind of want to visually um, confirm it. So this is one way of visually confirming it. The other way is let's look at something like um, CD4 versus CD8 data. So this is gonna be like conventional CD4 cells up here, conventional CD8 cells, and then other populations. And you can see, you know, these are the same color for the most part, with a few exceptions. These are pretty much the same color. These intermediate things are the same color. And these have a lot of different colors, probably because there's a lot of different heterogeneity in there that you're not seeing with the CD4 versus CD8 plot. Um, if we looked at B220, you can see all the things that are high for B220 are kind of the same color. So it's, um, 
you, know, you can look at this any number of ways, but um, what I'm seeing here is that it seems like it's nicely clustering um, the data that I would have manually clustered um, if I had to get, you know, assign CD4 and CD8 gates and D220 and all that stuff. Does that make sense? Um, but now the nice thing is you have all these percentages, right? So, so TCN didn't give you that. Now I can see the population one, zero has 41%. And I could say, well, what is population zero? I could just double click on it and I could, I could go through the markers if I wanted to and try to figure out what it is. Okay, so it's definitely very high for CD3, very high for CD8 alpha. So this is a T cell. Um, and then you could go through all the markers, but you could, you could um, see that that would be really tedious if you had to look at every marker, kind of like what we were doing over here when we did that probe. We could do a very similar strategy for Flosum, but one of the um, outputs of Flosum that's really nice, let me just save it before I talk too much. One of the outputs that's really nice is it's gonna give you a heat map um, to look at. So if I click on um, this, it's gonna make a folder after you run it. It's gonna give you a bunch of files. Um, let's just look, there's just certain ones that are kind of interesting. I'm just gonna look at this one that's called POP HM. This one it stands for population heat map. And what this does, is it tells me, um, here are all my populations. Uh, it doesn't put them in order. It actually puts them in kind of a weird order based on similar, you can see it makes like a phylogenetic tree kind of on similarity of the populations to each other, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, but then you can see every marker down here and a color code for um, you know, high expression is red low expression is blue. So let's just take, for example, an easy one to interpret. Let's take, um, let's take these two right here that are positive for CD4, right? So you can see um, they're both clusters are very positive for CD4. They're low for CD25. They're positive for TCR alpha beta. They're low for CD8, low for B220, low for TCR gamma delta. They're both high for C3, uh, but then you'll notice that population one is different than population two, and that population one um, has high expression of CD8 alpha. So that's kind of interesting. That's a, uh, a CD4 T cell, right? It's positive for CD4 and CD3, and it also has CD8 alpha. Um, and then population two is probably your more classical CD4 cell that's CD4 positive, CD3 positive, negative for everything else in that panel, except uh, TCR alpha beta, sorry. And so you could validate this heat map by, let's click on population one, the kind of interesting one that's positive for both CD8 alpha and CD4. And you might notice here that the percentage is really low, right? So this is a very rare population, 0.41%, whereas population two, there's a lot more of them. There's about 10 times more of those than there are of this weird one. So let's click on this weird one and let's just validate that indeed uh, it is what it's consistent with the heat map. And so you can see I'm looking at CD4 on the y-axis, CD8 alpha on the x-axis, and yep, positive for both CD4 and CD8 alpha. If we looked at CD3, it should also be positive for CD3 like we saw on the heat map. And it should be pretty positive for TCR alpha beta. So that's positive for TCR alpha beta. We could compare this to population two. Let's look again at CD4 versus CD8 alpha. And let's look at this one, CD4 versus CD8 alpha. So these are negative for CD8 alpha, those are positive, right? So we probably manually gating wouldn't have gated this population, but the nice thing about these tools is they um, pick up on little populations like that. So that's what I think the heat map is really, really useful because you can tell what's what based on this heat map. Like you could go through each 
population and kind of give it a, just kind of based on your knowledge of immunology, you can give it um, a name based on that. Um, but then there's some kind of odd ones too, right? Like this population 11, it's CD8 alpha positive, B220 positive, TCR alpha beta, and it's got CD4. So that's like a big mix of everything. Let's see what percentage that is. It's a small percentage, a really rare population. Um, anyway, so you kind of, I think, get the point of what the heat map allows you to do, allows you to kind of know what's what. Um, any questions so far? Okay. There's another thing that FlowSim spits out that I don't really care for, but they like people who use it do show this. There's another output that puts this like tree up. And this tree, basically this like bluish color, that would be all the same cluster. Um, and then you can see within this cluster, the marker intensity. So this has a lot of whatever this orange thing is. I can go up here. So these are TCR alpha beta positive. Has quite a bit of this teal color. Those are, oh, that's CD8 alpha. Um, so anyway, you can kind of tell what's what. Also looking at this string and ball like tree model. I'm, I don't care for this one as much. It's harder for me to understand. Than the, I like the heat map better personally. I'll close that. Um, and I should mention for FlowSim, so people who aren't using Flojo, you can, um, in R, you can run FlowSim and get all this exact same output without, you don't have to have Flojo to do this. Flojo just has built a plugin for it that uses R in the background uh, to run FlowSim. But I've run FlowSim just with R and it runs the same. Okay, um, so let's see. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to show you guys is um, cross-sample comparison. So by cross-sample comparison, I mean looking at the populations in different samples, right? That's at the end of the day, that's what you need to do with your data, right? You don't care about just one sample of data, you want to know what percentages there are in all these other um, in all these other samples. And so, what you can do with Flowsum, let me just save this, and then you can take the next sample and run Flowsum on that. And there's a function here called apply on map, and you could select the map, the Flowsum map that we generated for this first sample. And apply um, apply the same flow some clusters to this data. So I'm going to do that. I'm just going to hit OK. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to calculate the same 14 or sorry 15 populations and the percentages for each of those populations. Um, and so that's what it's done here. So population zero. Okay, so this is interesting. Population zero is 41% in this sample, and it's only 0.35% in this second sample. That's because um, this is a kind of a unique T cell subset. They're the intraepithelial um, lymphocytes. So they're pretty much only found in the IEL fraction. Um, so anyway, that's one way to do it. There is, and I could do that for all my samples. There is um, an inherent problem though in doing this. Um, the problem in doing that is when you generate your first flowsome map or TSNE as well, same deal with TSNE. When you generate it, um, let's say like my LPL sample had some types of cells in it that were not present in my IEL sample. That what, let's say there were just zero of them in my IEL sample. <clears throat> What'll happen is, um, you won't be able to, you'll basically lose information about those cells because they weren't present on the sample that you used to generate your map. And so that's, that's a huge problem. Um, that's why this, this strategy that I just did right here actually um, is no good. 
um, you really can't do it. Let's say um, maybe something more you can more relate to. Um, let's say um, you're looking at um, peck washes, right, from a naive mouse and a parasite infected mouse. Um, if you run your TSNI and Flosum on a naive mouse, you infect with and then you, you try to run the same thing on the parasite infected mouse. Well, the parasite infected mouse is gonna have a whole bunch of cell types infiltrating into the PEC that aren't present in a naive mouse. And you're not, you're not actually gonna be able to define those clusters because they weren't present on your, what we'll call the reference sample, like the sample that you generated the map from. Um, so, so there's a strategy that um, people have come up with to fix this, and it's a little bit laborious, but I'll walk you through it. Um, what you have to do is have data um, from each of your samples. So in this case, I have four samples, right? I have IELs, I have LPLs, I have Pyrus patches, and mesenteric lymphoid. I have to have data from every single one of those samples in the first file that I run TSNI and FLOSUM on. And so what that'll do is it'll, you'll get like a little sampling of everything. So that way when it generates the um, TSNI and, and FLOSUM uh, clusters, you can be sure that it's gonna generate all the possible clusters because all the possible types of cells are present in your data. I don't know if that makes sense. It's kind of a little bit um, hard to logically explain, um, but I think I'll go through and I'll show you what I mean and it should make, make more sense. And the other thing is um, when you're making this um, single file, um, it's called a concatenated file or some, some programs I think call it a merged file, merged or concatenated. Basically means you're taking like pieces of data from several FCS files, putting them into one. You also wanna make sure when you're doing that, that you're getting the same number, like the same sampling from each file. What I mean by that is, um, like this IEL file, this has 92,000 cells in it. This one has 112,000, and this one has 362,000, that one has 800,000. So the 800,000 one, if I just, let's say I just merge all of them together, like totally, I would get like a million, over a million events, but most of them would be from this one sample. So it would be overrepresented in the data. And so we actually don't want that. We want um, equal representation of all our files, um, and we want to merge them into one. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do that real quick. I'm going to, I'm going to create a new workspace and just holler at me if you want me to stop. Um, I'm going to take our exported data that we had just made. I'm going to put it in there. I really don't want all the TSNI and Flosum stuff because it just gets too confusing. Um, what I want now is just the exported data, and I'm going to run a command on this um, that's called downsample. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever downsampled your data before, but basically it's a way to um, randomly select events or cells um, and get a, a, an exact number. Actually, I'm just going to do it on one file first. Oops, how do I unselect? Oh, can't figure out how to unselect. It doesn't matter. Um, so I'm going to click on the first file, and I'm going to go to plugins, and I have a plugin called Downsample. I think Flojo may not have this built in. You may have to download the plugin just like the Flosum plugin. Um, so I'm going to have to save this real quick. All this down sample. Um, I'm going to tell it. Um, I'm going to tell it fifteen thousand. I want fifteen thousand cells from each um, from each file, and I'm just going to call the population name down. I'm going to hit OK. Um, I'm going to hit cancel here. I only wanted to select one file and do it, and it. Sorry, one second, let me try this again. Hmm. 
doesn't want to do it. Hold on one sec. Let me start over. <clears throat> This one, one sample, 15,000. Hmm, not sure why it doesn't want to down sample. Let me restart for you real quick. So what it did was it created an, a gate within this one called down. And you see it has 15,000 events in it. If I were to click on this, let's just click on it and look at um, CD3 versus B220. Um, so what you'll notice is if I click on the parent, CD3 versus B220, the data is exactly the same because it's the same data. It's just there's a lot less of it here than over here. Um, so this is only 15,000 events. This is 92,000, right? It's really important to do this because um, you don't want, um, you want equal representation. And also when I merge this, I'm going to have four files at 15,000 each. I'm going to have 60,000 events. That's a fair amount for, um, for TSNE to run. You don't want it too big. You don't want a million events and run TSNE. It'll take you like hours. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is just drag this up to all samples. It's just gonna, okay, so it's going to now generate 15,000 events for all of my samples. So let me save this. So we could kind of toggle through them. So you can see they're very different, right? This is mesenteric lymph node. This is Pyre's patch. This is LPL and this is the IEL. Okay. So save it again. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge all of this into a single file. So I'm going to right click on this, hit select equivalent nodes, right click again, hit export concatenate again, that same command. So now instead of exporting, I'm going to click here where it says concatenate. Tell it where to go. That's fine. Let's just go there. I'm going to include all the events. Um, and here I can just hit, at this point, I can hit all uncompensated parameters. It's already, um, like I was talking about when we did the export, it like hardwired the compensation into the file. So at this point, I can just hit all uncompensated parameters. The compensation is already fixed at this point. So I'm going to hit concatenate. It did it. I'll open it in a new workspace and I will close. Did it open in the workspace? Oh yeah, there it is. So it made a new workspace and you can see it has 60,000 events in it. So it has 15,000 from each of my files. Um, so I can open this and let's look at um, Let's look at CD, let's look at CD3 versus B220 again. And so you can see there's 60,000 dots worth of stuff, but this is all dots from those four files all combined to, together. Um, 
And now if you wanted to tell, well, what dots are from the IELs and the LPLs and the Pyrus patch and the, and the mesenteric lymph node, there's a way to do that. So what you can do is um, click here on the axis and it created a new parameter called sample ID. So if I click on that, what you're gonna see is it segregates into four different um, clusters, right? You can see something here, 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 and here. You can look at this as a histogram if you want, it's probably easier. And it doesn't explicitly name them, which is a little annoying. You have to go through and do it. But the order is the same as the order you had here. So the first one here is going to be IEL. So I could draw a gate and I can call this IEL. The second one is LPL. The third one is Pyre's Patch. It's called Pyre. And the fourth one is the mesenteric lymph node. And you should see that they're each 25%. That's because you had exactly one quarter of each of those types uh, of, from each of those files. I'm just going to save this at this point. Let's call this uh, merged. Okay. So now, <clears throat> Let's say we want to run TSNI on this. So we can do that. We can go to our TSNI um, plugin. Again, we're going to select the same things we did before. Um, let's just leave the, all, this, all these things the same and run it. This one should take a little less because it's about you know, it's, it should go a little faster. It should just take about two minutes. While this is running, do you guys have any, are there any questions as to what I'm doing and why? This can get a little bit hairy if you have like, let's say you have 20 files that you're trying to like, Let's say you have um, 10 mice per group and you have two groups and you're trying to do this, you could imagine you would have had to merge uh, 20 files into a single file um, and then do this process. So it can get really, it can get a little bit, um, I don't know, yeah, it can get a little bit difficult if you have a lot of files. Do you recommend that 15,000 um, kind of cell number as the when you concatenate? Um, not necessarily. What I usually do when I concatenate is um, I have like a number I want the concatenated file to be. Like let's say usually 100,000 to 200,000 is a pretty good number so that TC doesn't take like forever to run. Um, so if I had 10 files, I might do 10,000 per file to get to 100,000. Okay. If I have 20 files, I might still do 10,000 per file. I would just have a bigger concatenated file. You don't want to go too few to where you're like missing, you're, you're not getting a good representation per, um, per sample. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say at a minimum, you probably want 10,000. Um, yeah. Um, and the other thing to take into account is like, let's say you had Let's say you had 10 files. Uh, they all had like 50,000 events, except one of them only had 20,000 events. You would probably need to go down to the lowest number so that you aren't undersampling that one file. So you would need to do 20,000 from all the files. Um, if you had one file that let's say only had 300 cells in, in one file, you, could, you would either exclude that file or you would just know the caveat that that one file is being like underrepresented in the, in the data, you know? Okay. I mean, you could still do it. You would just, just bear that in mind that it might not be the perfect analysis.
Right before you concatenated, you did the right click, equivocate, and then what was, what do you click on after that? Like you do another right click, but I missed what you clicked on. Oh yeah, yeah, so you would right click and hit select equivalent nodes. That just like selects all the files, and then you would right click again, and there's a button called export concatenate. Oh, okay. And then you would click on the button that says concatenate as opposed to export. Okay. Okay, there we go, it finished. So here's our TSNE. You're going to see it looks very similar to what we had generated before, um, except this TSNE now is generated using sampling of all the files. Let me heat map on CD4. Yeah, so we're still seeing about probably the same number of clusters, probably about 15 clusters, 10 to 15 clusters. Um, but now, let me see if I click on sample ID. Yeah, so you can heat map based on sample ID. So this is kind of interesting because you can see, um, you can see where the different cells are coming from. So like this green, so like each um, sample is a different color. So like one of those, like the orange sample, for example, had a whole, excuse me, had a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of um, these cells and these cells, right? But not many of these cells. So what we can do is we can actually say, well, what is that? We could click on the mesenteric lymph node sample, and let's look at um, let's look at the TSNE parameters. So let's look at one. Sorry, two versus one. And what you can see here is. This is TSNE from just the mesenteric lymph node. You can see most of the cells are in this cluster and this cluster. There's almost no cells in here, and there's really no cells up here, right? So this type of cell that's present in one of the samples is absolutely not present at all in the mesenteric lymph node. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that, this is kind of how, what I was getting at with respect to like you need all the data to give you combined together to give you all the possible cellular populations. Because like the mesenteric lymph node, for example, didn't have several of these cell types. Let's look at the IEL. So you can see this one is really heavily enriched for this cell type up here. It doesn't have a ton of uh, and some stuff down here and here. Doesn't have a ton of this over here. I'm guessing these are CD4 T cells. Let's see. Yep. So uh, this is, I'm just heat mapping on CD4 and I can see these are all the CD4 T cells. So in the IEL fraction, there's very few CD4 T cells, but in the mesenteric lymph node, there's, there's a lot of CD4 T cells. So that all makes sense. Okay. So let's save this again. So now, let's say we want to figure out, well, what percentages of each of our populations are there in this? Um, let's do, um, let's run FlowSum again. So I'm gonna click up here on the concatenated file, just on the, the root file, and I'm gonna go to Workspace, Plugins, FlowSum, and I'm gonna um, select the same old parameters, we've been doing. I'm going to select 15 clusters again. And again, this is arbitrary. You can select, I can select more than 15. Actually, let's do that. Let's select 20. Let's just see what happens. Um, hit OK. I'm going to let it run. <clears throat> okay. So it's finished running, and now it came up with all these populations. We could go back to our TSNE, 
and color our axis based on Flosum. And again, we can see it did a really nice job of clustering. So again, each different color on this is like a different Flosum cluster. And so it correlates really well with how TSNI grouped the data, is how Flosum grouped the data. So these look really uh, nicely validated. And now what we can do is I have all these populate 20 populations on all the merge data. And now it's just a simple drag and drop, just like you do with all your other gates in Flojo. Let me save this real quick. I'm going to drag all these into the IEL sample. And then I'm going to drag them all into the LPL sample. Okay, so now what I have is for every sample, I have the percentages of each of those flowsome clusters. And so let's say we wanted to know, um, okay, let's just pick a population. Let's just pick, let's just pick B cells, right? Um, I wanna, uh, one sec. Okay, let me find, my flowsome heat map. So I'm gonna to go to down sample two. No, nope, wasn't that. Oh, concatenate here. And then our flowsome, let's pull up our flowsome heat map. Let's say, okay, well, which one are just your conventional B220 positive B cells? Okay, so you see now that we've got 20 populations instead of 15, you can actually see it kind of has clustered B cells, your, what I would consider a conventional B cell, which is B220 positive and CD3 negative. I've got these three clusters right here that all look kind of similar to each other, except for, you know, this one has some TCR on it. This one over here has some uh, CD8 beta on it. Let's just take this one, POP15. POP15 is probably what I would consider conventional B cell. So I can go to my flowsome um, data here and I can say, well, what pot, how much is pot 15? So of the IEL fraction, it's 13%. Uh, of the LPL fraction, it's 77%. It's really high. Of the mesenteric lymph node, it's 26%. And of the Pyrus patch, it's 75%. And so that kind of does, is in line with biology. Um, Pyrus patches are full of B cells. Um, um, mesenteric lymph node should have about 20% B cells. So that's roughly what's there. Um, IEL has very few B cells, about well, 13%. So anyway, you can um, now start to make these comparisons. Now let's say, um, so for us, we were doing in this demo, we're doing four different tissues that we're comparing. Let's say though, this was like mouse one, mouse two, mouse three, mouse four, right? Um, and you were trying to, let's say you had two control group and two in an experimental group, and you wanted to just export all these numbers. Um, so I don't know if you guys have used the table editor in Flojo, but this is pretty much what I would do is open the table editor. Um, and I would drag in all these populations. Now it may be too many to drag in. Let's see, no, it did it. Um, this is gonna be a little bit annoying, but basically I'm gonna create a Excel file. Um, let me just figure out where to save it. I'm gonna create the table there. Okay, so let's go open our table. Table, okay. And this is gonna be all those percentages, population percentages, outputted um, into an Excel table. 
So I don't know if you guys have used table editor before. Basically, you're going to see all the populations. It's going to be a little tedious to um, put all these in the right spot. But then once you do that, you would be able to compare. So this is like IEL population 0, pop 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, et cetera. And then this is the LPL here for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So you have all the, basically you have all the percentages that are here. And you could then, you know, do something like just run t-tests on the populations to, um, to see if anything is statistically different. Um, I think that's what I wanted to show you guys. So you should basically, after seeing this, you should have kind of the tools to visualize high dimensional data, cluster it, and then compare the clusters across um, samples. Um, do you guys have any questions at this point? No, I don't think so.